Welcome to Jason Live. I'm Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series, where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. And today's role model is Stefan Burns. And Stefan is a Hi. geophysicist, and he works at Geometrics Instruments. And he's also a TV co-host, which is really cool, of a show on the Science Channel called Secrets of the Underground. And we're going to learn all about our STEM role model and more when we connect with Stefan in just a moment. But but first, I want to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So right below this video window, you're going to see a box where you can send in your questions and any comments that you have. And we're going to try to get as many of those questions and comments in as we possibly can. So keep an ear out for your name and your question. Right now, it's time to say hello to Stefan. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Ailey. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun and you know, I'm excited to kind of provide some perspective and give back to all the viewers who are tuning in. Well, let's hop right in and just, can you tell us a little bit about um, what our geo, what a geophysicist is? Yeah, so that's the question I get a lot and it's kind of difficult to answer because it, it, it can't really be simplified into a two word, you know, sound bite. But basically a geophysicist uh studies the physics of the earth so the way materials interact so the way sound travels through the subsurface the ground the way electricity can travel through the ground uh physical properties like that that can be measured that's what a geophysicist um you know studies well we have two questions in from rachel at huddleston elementary school and brett jaylee and austin want to know what kind of tools do you use in your work? And what are the names of some of the tools you use? And what do you use them for? Oh man, we're jumping straight into the uh, the goodies. So behind me, I've actually set up a whole bunch of the uh, equipment that a geophysicist might use. Uh, geologists and geophysicists use a lot of equipment, but I think geophysicists use the coolest equipment because it's all these big electronic pieces uh, and they all measure different properties of the earth. So. This is a marine magnetometer, and it measures the uh, it measures basically the magnetic field uh, that the ocean might have. And then we have a backpack magnetometer here. We have a uh, another type of mag here, and then we also have a seismograph, which would measure uh, any energy that's being transmitted through the Earth, like what might happen during an earthquake. So there's lots of equipment, um, and it's used for a whole variety of things, but everything from oil and gas exploration to mining to earthquake recording and kind of uh, monitoring is all, you know, governed and recorded by these geophysical pieces of equipment here. Those are really fun toys, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about them more. So. Well, we, I'm sure we will. We have a question from Elliot wanting to know, what is the most interesting thing that you have found underground? Oh, good grief. Uh, probably. So there's a lot of things you can find underground. Uh, anything from just like a, a water or a gas utility line that will feed to your house. Uh, you can find that geophysics all the way to, um, you know, massive magma chambers that are intricately modeled and everything. The coolest thing I've probably found was we were in uh, Jamaica for the show and we were scanning uh, Henry Morgan's old property uh, back in the late 1600s. And, uh, and basically there's a whole bunch of limestone caves there and no one's really mapped or modeled those caves. And we were, Rob and I were going around and we were scanning with the ground penetrating radar, a piece of equipment I don't have here. And we found a new, void or a new cave that had never been explored before. Uh, we, we didn't have the opportunity to kind of dig into it and explore it, but it's a very clear signature. So when, when I rolled over it and I saw that signature, it was uh, clear as daylight. Wow. Well, keeping going in that vein, Hannah wants to know, and we have another a second grade class wants to know, what kind of treasure have you found? And when do you find treasures, what, yeah, when, when you find them, what are they? So, um, it, well, the, the treasure really depends on the client. Uh, we have, I have looked for treasure before using geophysics, <clears throat> metal detectors, uh, magnetic field detectors, uh, ground penetrating radar, all these different tools can be used to find treasure. 
And a lot of people, active treasure hunters nowadays, they've really tapped into the geophysics to try to find what they're looking for. <clears throat> I've looked for them. It's a lot harder to find treasure than you might think. So I tried really hard and unfortunately I didn't find anything. Uh, but you know, the, the client, let's say your customer, they might have a question which they need answered, which no one else can answer for them. And uh, when you find, when you're able to give them a really concise or a clear answer and and they might not be expecting that or it was a pretty low probability that's a lot of that's really cool and that's a lot of fun and it's all done without actually having to get your hands on it it's kind of like looking into space it's just all done through observation which i which i find fascinating so it's kind of kind of like a superpower it's, it's like it's, it's like almost like you start to develop rather than superman yeah, you start to develop almost like a sixth sense because you're you're measuring like electrical properties or you know the properties of earth when sound travels through that's not something that we're normally in tune with but if you use this equipment enough you start to get an understanding of it wow well jose from phoenix <clears throat> wants to know is your career dangerous uh it can be um this marine magnetometer for example is used on boats so we also have some other equipment, which is a uh, boat based. And, you know, sometimes those boats are actually icebreakers. I might go to the Antarctic or the Arctic Circle. So you might be riding swells of 40 feet. Um, and then oftentimes you're setting off explosives for the uh, seismograph here. So you might be setting up explosive charges and uh, you don't want that to detonate, obviously, while you're there. So you have to be careful. Um, and then a lot of the geophysics industry is also construction related. So construction, uh, the construction industry is, uh, can be pretty, pretty intense. They follow a lot of safety procedures, but yeah, it's, it's not the, uh, it's an exciting industry to say the least. I have a lot of fun doing it. You're always on your toes. We have Curtis Tripp, uh, who is a middle school student in Maine. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Kurt, with, and he, it says, uh, what does an average day in your job look like? So the way it's worked out for me thus far is you kind of get these splits. You have your office days where you're talking to customers or clients or you're looking over data. And then you have your field days where you're out there for 12, 14 hours. And uh, it, it might be 100 degrees. It might be snowing depending on where you're living. But you have work to do out in the field. So right now, my average day is I'm working with customers a lot, helping them uh, learn uh the various pieces of equipment we have but uh for the show our average day was 14 hours uh filming also still collecting geophysical data i was doing all the processing um along with uh my my the, the other host rob he was also helping me there too uh it's just very varied and uh you're always you're always kind of doing something new that you haven't done before and it's a lot of fun yeah the, the fact that you're a geophysicist and you've also done geophysics and used all your equipment on a television show seems pretty cool to me. And I, I just have to mention for a moment, because if I don't, I may get in trouble, that <laughs> your co-host on the show is my husband, Rob Nelson. So yes. if, I, if I didn't say that, oh, there he is right there. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, Rob you. holding a uh, mushroom because he's the biologist and uh, I'm holding a piece of uh, coal there because I'm the geologist. That is just, it's just too cool that you get to do your science on television. So let's move on from Lily wants to know, do you work individually or do you work with multiple people? So uh, Geometrics is a company of about 80 to 100 people and we sell equipment worldwide. And we also do training for all the equipment. And a lot of times the, the client will buy the equipment, do the training, and then they also want to be on site as an advisor as they collect the uh, the data. So we, we kind of do, we run the full gamut of what we do. Um, but it's a it's a larger industry than many people think of. It's it's niche, so you don't get too much, uh, too many other industries kind of feeding into it. But our company here is 80 people. And then with the show, uh, the filming crew was probably about 10 people, uh, but it felt like 30 because we were all just working so hard. So. It's um, it's it's a it's a large it's a large industry. Abby J wants to know: During your job, do you ever get a break, or are you always working? <laughs> I'm always working. Uh, 
hint, hint, <laughs> if the boss is watching. <laughs> no, um, you get breaks, but uh, the safety the safety regulations there are pretty strict. Uh, they they require you to take you know breaks every four hours and a lunch break. Um, but sometimes those breaks are pretty quick, and you're you're just starting to get relaxed when you have to jump back up and get going again. So uh, it can be tough, but what I've noticed is I've never necessarily like been working and been like, oh man, I really need a break. Like I'm so jazzed to be doing it. Uh, and there's so much excitement there that it's almost like I don't want to take a break. Like, okay, let's get back. Let's get going. Um, but yeah, I, I do get to take breaks. Uh, I'm not working myself uh, to the bone. Yeah, it does seem like you kind of enjoy the work you do. I do. <laughs> Uh, JP Tiger 13 wants to know what kinds of locations have you traveled to for your career? Have you gone anywhere volcanic? I have gone some places which are volcanic in nature. So um, I, I full full uh, full transparency, I started this job at Geometrics just about a month ago. So I haven't done any traveling for Geometrics yet, but a lot of the the longtime employees here, they, uh, they've been to 30, 40, 50 countries through this job. So I'm really excited to travel for Geometrics, uh, going basically all over the world. For Secrets Underground, uh, where the Science Channel show where we did a lot of geophysics, uh, I traveled to Europe, I traveled to the Middle East, also traveled to the Caribbean, and um, that was a lot of fun. All those places were really unique. And um, what was the last part of the question? Was, uh, have you gone anywhere volcanic? Ah, uh, yes, the volcanic uh, part. So we went to Italy, and uh, Italy is a highly volcanic uh, region. There's something called the Campanian volcanic arc that runs right underneath Italy. And that's why you have all these iconic volcanoes like Mount Etna and Mount Vesuvius, which, uh, which I visited both of. And uh, they are really quite incredible sites. If you're ever in Italy, I highly recommend you go check out the different volcanic systems there. It'll just blow your mind. We have a, a comment or a question from Joey wanting to know, what's the furthest you go into Earth? The crust, the mantle, or the core? Uh, I'm assuming good. they mean, how far does your equipment go? Good question. Uh, first, I just want to say, Joey, I like your name. It's the same name as my turtle. So, um, but <laughs> the it depends. Geophysics can go all the way from the crust to the core. I specialize in just uh, near surface geophysics. So just the crust. Um, but using different techniques, uh, people have been able to, you know, collect data all the way down in the Earth's core. And that's how we know that it's, uh, you know, uh, a big ball of iron and molten iron and stuff. Uh, there's indirect observations that we make. Same with astronomy, a lot of indirect observations, but the science is sound. So you can, you can figure out what that is. And then a lot, of, uh, a lot of geophysics is also done in the mantle, specifically in regards to modeling volcanoes and for uh, modeling earthquakes. Um, but I would say the bulk of the geophysics that's done is done in the crust, looking for mineral deposits, oil and gas, and then also very near surface used for like construction and such. Cool. Rohan from JCD STEM. Shout out to JCD STEM. They always have great questions. Hey. He wonders, uh, do you feel that natural disasters are a problem and that we can bring the number down? Um, well, for humans, natural disasters are definitely a problem for probably most animals. But for, for the Earth, that's just a natural phenomenon. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily classify it as a, you know, a problem, just more different a different type of environment. Um, eventually, this is a little bit of a sci-fi question. Uh, eventually, once we're able to, you know, control and manipulate the weather, I think we will be able to bring down a lot of natural disasters. What the long-term effect on the planet is going to be once we're at that point, I don't know. In regards to human civilization, it'll be a big positive. Um, but I definitely think that we should be designing our cities safer, and we should be, you know, potentially not building our cities in areas that are prone to massive natural disasters. Good idea. I completely agree with you. <laughs> Elliot is wondering, how did you get to be a TV host? That's so cool. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of hard work and it was also quite a bit of luck. My prior company I was working for, which I also did geophysics for, uh, got an email from the production company for Science Channel. 
and they were looking for geophysicists to help out for season one, uh, of which Rob, Haley's husband, was the, the main and only host. So I helped out with season one a lot, um, providing equipment. I was also on, on screen for two episodes, and I, I kept in communication with them. I, I helped them out a lot in regards to understanding the equipment and also just sending them ideas about cool things they could check out. So when season two came around, I was, I guess, kind of at the top of the list in regards to if they wanted to have uh, a, a science, uh, a geophysics based co-host. So then I did a whole interview process and um, I was blown away, but they asked me to be the co-host. And uh, after that, the rest is history. I, um, I was there with Rob for eight episodes and we did, you know, cool investigations and in geophysics all across the world. So it was an unforgettable experience. Oh, I love the show. I'm probably a little bit biased, but I love the show. <laughs> um, Paolo from Phoenix wants to know, what's the most amazing thing that you've found and the most weird thing you've found in episodes of Secrets of the Underground? Uh, that's a tough one. The weirdest thing, I'll start with the weirdest one. Uh, and you know, they're actually kind of, I think one the same. Uh, when we were in Israel, we were looking for the lost temple treasures, basically, these were these treasures that were around King Solomon's time. And um, they're these huge, massive gold menorahs and such, and they've been lost. And we know that the Romans uh, plundered them at one point. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of theories as to where they are. And one of the theories places them back in Israel on one of these churches called the Nea Church. So we went into the underbelly of the Nea Church. Uh, we got exclusive access and we did a whole bunch of scans of the Nea church using GPR and also um, basically a type of magnetometer. Uh, and we were not expecting this. We found this huge void in the Nea church off, off, off kind of against the wall. And it is very clear and it's not something you expect. Just there was solid stone everywhere else. And all of a sudden there was like, it almost looked like a, another uh, like corridor or tunnel or something. So. It would have been great to excavate into that and see where that led. No one knew that was there. And I think it's probably original feature of the church, but that was very striking, very unusual, and also like really exciting because imagine opening that up and let's say, you know, the lost temple treasures of 2000 years are in that opening or lead to, you know, the tunnel leads to them. So I always thought that was really, really cool. You get to see things with all of these instruments that we just would never know. That is just so interesting. And just things that could lead to other discoveries. That's really cool. Oh, let's see. I've lost audio here a little bit. Let me see if we get it back real quick. Do you still, uh, can you guys get it too? Well, it's, it, this is live, so you never know what's gonna happen here. Can you hear me now? I can. I okay. got you back. It was okay, muted great. for some reason. Um, it didn't. It didn't like my response. I suppose. Ah. <laughs> um, we can move right on to some more questions. Abby wants to know: Can being a oh, actually, this is uh, oh yeah. Abby wants to know: Can being a geophysicist affect your health? And uh, Denise from Phoenix wants to know: How many hours of sleep do you get? Um, so I actually answered the sleep question on an interview I did for Jason Learning. I, sh I shoot for eight hours of sleep. And I recommend everyone watching this get eight hours of sleep. If you're a kid, even more. Uh, your developing brain needs it. It's critical. So get your sleep. I get eight hours. Um, and then, yeah, the geophysics, the industry can be uh, a bit hazardous to your health at times. But a lot of precautions are taken. The uh, one of the most, I'd say, long-term dangerous areas that I was at was uh, the Bay Area refineries. There's a whole bunch of oil and gas refineries to make like the gasoline in your car located in the San Francisco area. And I worked there and they use a lot of chemicals. So you're, they do a good job of cleaning that up as much as possible, but you're still breathing in a lot of these fumes. So I'm glad to kind of be out of that industry uh, and besides that, I mean, it's just standard stuff. You, you don't want to uh, obviously, you know, watch your step and be safe with what you're doing. But it's I there's a lot of jobs which are a lot more dangerous. So 
uh, I count my, I consider myself pretty lucky to be able to have an adventurous job that doesn't put me too far in a harm's way. Well, it looks like we're transitioning a little bit to um, your past career with these next questions coming up. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we're live and your questions, they can still come in and we can still get to these which are and, and, and ask anything specific for what Stefan is talking about right now. And we have Kylie who's wondering, when you were little, did you ever think of doing this career? Um, no. Um, I, I've always been a fan of geology and rocks. I had a rock collection and I've always been a huge outdoor fanatic. Um, I was in the Boy Scouts, I'm an Eagle Scout. So camping, exploring, all that stuff. It, it, it took me some time to put the two together and really figure it out. Uh, and that's not, it's not, it's not a bad thing. A lot of people think that you need to have your career finalize and set before you go to college or in your mind sophomore year of high school don't worry you'll find out what you need to do in all good time um but this the sciences i always knew the sciences were going to be where i was going to go i'm, I'm a huge science fanatic and more than just geology and geophysics uh, all sciences chemistry uh physiology all that stuff i'm super big into um so i knew i was going to go that direction but Geology and geophysics, it took a, uh, a college class for me to really just know that's where I wanted to go. Lily wants to know, what was your favorite subject in middle school? Uh, in middle school, I really enjoyed earth science. Uh, so that was, that was a clue for sure. Um, but I was also a really big fan of, uh, I think it was just, I think it was just regular science or maybe it was like middle school chemistry. Uh, just we did a lot of experiments, which were really fun. So we did bottle rockets. I'm sure you guys have done something similar before where you get the two liter bottle turned into a rocket. And uh, I got really in depth with that, trying to make it as accurate and consistent as possible. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I've always, I've always enjoyed the mathematics. So I always enjoyed math class. Um, I, I excelled there, and it's really it's really beautiful being able to take these uh, physical, you know, properties or things and be able to translate them into basically the universe's language of uh, math. That sounds really beautiful the way you just said that. <laughs> you know, it's just it really is. It's like science helps us know our world and know our universe in so many different kinds of languages. Mm -hmm. So. That's just my, my thought there, beautifully said. <laughs> Andre from JCD STEM wants to know, did you feel that being an Eagle Scout helped you choose the job you wanted? Um, it did because, and maybe not directly, maybe not the way that this uh, person is thinking, but it, it really, you learn so much, at least I learned so much through that organization and there are dozens of organizations like this. It's not like only the, the scouts can offer this, you know, there's 4-H, there's other extracurriculars, but really the, the leadership skills I learned, the, uh, the kind of cooperative skills I learned, and then also just a lot of like, you know, rope tying or learning how to make a bowline knot. You know, those, those, those things take consistency and effort, and it's just really applicable to the real world where you need to be able to put the time in and be consistent and practice uh, to make things happen, but really the scouts is being outdoors going through all the different merit badges uh, I probably have a geology merit badge somewhere in my in, on my sash um, And it really I have I know I have a space one for sure. So going through all those different merit badges all those different programs it really kind of ex uh, exposed me to a wide range of Industries and sciences and things of that nature that I wouldn't have been wouldn't have been exposed to in school. So infinitely grateful to the scouts. That is so neat. I didn't think about it like that. Just the fact that you get to see so many different kinds of things and then are able to kind of have them in front of you to go, what do I like? What don't I like? What am I attracted to? It's really neat. Oh, we have a comment from Willow from Ms. Duguay's class. Whoop, whoop, Ms. Duguay's class. Um, <laughs> what were you studying when you visited volcanoes in Italy and why? So what we were studying in Italy was uh, there's a large volcanic system in Italy called uh, Campi Flagre, and it's 
it's right on the edge of being classified as a super volcano. And uh, as you might know, a super volcano is like a volcano to just supersize. Yellowstone is a common example. And people talk about how if it was to blow up, it would be doomsday and everything. So Italy basically has its own super volcano. And what we were measuring uh, there was whether it's becoming more active. Um, over the past millennia, um, for thousands of years, basically the caldera of Campi Flagre has been filling up and then reducing in magma. But eventually it fills up to a point where it explodes. And recently there's been a lot of magma activity increasing. And scientists are trying to determine whether it's you know, potentially going to explode in our lifetime or in the near future. So we ran a whole bunch of scientific tests to determine that. And we can't, you know, there's no, we didn't definitively find out whether it's going to explode or not, but it's definitely uh, something that we should be concerned about and keep our eyes on and keep, to, we should keep monitoring it. Yeah, I did see that episode and you like threw something in a big bubbling cauldron of something uh, in the ground and the, the temperature kept rising. The thermocoupler, that's what it is. Can you tell us about the thermocoupler and what kind of reading you took? Yeah, so we went to uh, an area with a lot of geothermal activity. Basically, you'll have this large magma body, and then that heat will hit the water table, and then the water will get superheated. So there are these mud pools that are bubbling like crazy. Um, and a thermocouple is a, basically a type of thermometer that can measure the temperature. And we took it, and it can withstand extreme temperatures. So we threw it into this mud pool that was bubbling like crazy to determine the temperature of it. And the reason why it's important is because if the mud pool is to get hotter, that's a pretty clear indication that the magma pool, like the magma body underneath the actual volcano is, uh, is increasing in size or activity. So that's what we it? use the, the thermocouple for. And was it, did you find that it was? Uh, the, the temperature that we read was pretty close to an all time high. Scientists have been monitoring it for, for quite a long time. And uh, it has been increasing for a while now. And we, we, we caught a reading near the upper end of that. So it was very hot, very steamy, very sulfury. Exciting. It's a very exciting way to use your tech. We have another question coming in here. Um, what does it take to classify a volcano as a super volcano? Uh, so I don't know the specifics there, but I think it just depends on the size. Um, there's some good programs I remember seeing as a kid on like the Sci uh, Science Channel Discovery and History. And they show the, it was like this really cool graphic that showed like a tiny little volcano, then showed Mount St. Helens, and then it showed, you know, different volcanoes going all the way up to Yellowstone. And I think it's basically the size of the magma reservoir that matters. So if it's like five cubic miles, maybe that's a tiny one, but if it's like 50 cubic miles, obviously the potential is much higher. So uh, I think that's the main criteria they use, but then also probably how active it is, uh, is important. We have two questions that are very similar coming from Rohan and Drew. Do you use computers in your job? And how does your knowledge of computers help you be a better geophysicist? So I do use computers. Uh, I'm using a computer uh, day to day with my new job. Uh, a lot of it for my new job, I do a lot of sales also. So I'm out there in the field, I'm collecting data, I'm helping customers, but I'm also uh, educating our customers and selling them equipment. Uh, so I'll use a lot of sales platforms to do things of that nature. But uh, kind of on the more fun side is there's also a lot of data analysis programs that I might use. So you take all your raw data from the pieces of equipment back here and you load them into these programs and you can adjust the parameters, tweak them and model them and get some really cool results out of them. And uh, that's kind of where the full sixth sense comes in. You, you start to take this raw data and then you can process and then you actually see what it was that you were looking at underground. Uh, so computers are very important. Uh, you have to be computer savvy. I know when I was a kid, at first, computers were just starting to become pretty ubiquitous. And at first, I wasn't a fan of computers. But then I realized like how powerful of a tool the computer is. So I swapped my opinion. And now I'm uh, definitely big on you know tech in general. I think it's uh, really important to be proficient there. 
I, I really enjoyed all the modeling that I saw you do on the show, just because you could really get an amazing visual of the day. Really neat. And let's see, we have um, Criminal Intermediate, Miss Griffin's class, wondering what's the weirdest anomaly you've seen on your equipment ever? And that's being asked from Diego. Ever, man. Um, oh, we've lost your sound. Oh, no, it's back. Back, back, okay, cool. Weirdest anomaly ever. Uh, I mean, there's there's some things you come across that you just don't expect. You're, you're in the middle of a field, and it looks completely barren and empty. And then you start to get pinging noises and sounds because often the equipment will communicate to you in that in that way. And you have no idea what it is. Um, so I've been walking around it just in completely abandoned fields before and I'll get huge magnetic spikes. And clearly there's something extremely metallic there. And that might be a cultural artifact that could be a different type of rock. Um, most unusual, uh, I was recently at a, I was at a site, actually one of the, the refineries that I was talking about earlier, and we kept getting called out to this section of the refinery to do surveys uh, because we kept finding these weird anomalies. We didn't know how to explain it. Hmm. And um, we scanned it, everything, and it turns out there was, um, you know, 20 years ago or at least like 100 years ago, there was uh, some, they basically dumped a whole bunch of stuff there and no, everyone forgot about it. It was completely out of the blue. So you encounter things like that a lot. Um, I, I can't think of the most unusual right now, but I mean, most every job a geophysicist is called out because something is unusual. So we're not usually called out for the mundane things. So most every job is pretty unique. So your job really is finding the secrets of the underground. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I laughed way too much at that. Okay, Harith would like to know, uh, how are your skills as a geologist and a physicist, how do they connect to each other? So uh, they connect pretty well. Um, our understanding of the earth is basically governed uh, and to a large part by our understanding of physics. So we wouldn't know, for example, that the earth had a, a solid metal core with a outer core that's liquid if we weren't able to measure the magnetic field of the earth because it's such a strong magnetic field if you look at other planets their magnetic field is pretty poor uh like mars for example we know that there's some sort of dynamo action happening on the inside of the planet and by measuring the magnetic field and a couple of other properties we were able to determine that the earth you know has this very unique core um, so they really go hand in hand and then, uh, you know, really everything is governed by physics. So the way the light is transmitting, reflecting off of me and then going into the, the webcam here. So then you can be broadcasted and seen that's all governed by physics. So it's really important. And I think it's a pretty natural marriage between the two. Well, let's jump right into a, a doozy here because I think, I think you're gonna have fun with this one. Are there okay. any other fields of science that you would like to study? Oh man, there's so many. Um, I could have easily gone into chemistry, uh, like biochem. Uh, I think genetic research is really, really cool what they're doing now with like CRISPR and Cas9. They're editing genomes and you know, this, this is on live animals so they can edit the genome of a live animal and you can remove a lot of diseases that way. Um, I think the study of the brain is fascinating. Probably the most complex structure humans have ever found in the universe is the human brain. Our understanding of it is like zero. So that's fascinating. Uh, I think the second most complex thing probably in the universe is the human body and metabolism. So understanding and you know, learning about the human metabolism, human physiology, nutrition, I think all that's really, really interesting. Uh, so I could have easily gone that direction. Uh, at one point, I wanted to be an engineer because I loved Legos so much. And uh, I made these super elaborate Lego structures. So I think, you know, like building bridges or civil engineering, that's all really fascinating. I mean, for me, it's just a love of 
STEM and science in general. Um, I think I could have translated that to 20 different careers and been fine um, and loved all my jobs there. I, I also wanted to be a turtle, a sea turtle researcher. So I guess marine biologist at one point. So really um, anything, the big requirement for me was also be able to go outdoors, uh, explore the world. Um, right now, uh, this job is uh, office based, but also eventually I'll be doing a lot of traveling to all these different countries. So I'm really excited for that. And that's a big requirement for me. Just basically outdoors and STEM. That's my, that's, I could get anything in there. See, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mrs. DeMaio's second grade Salem school. And we have also Mrs. Martinez's fifth grade class want to know uh, some related things. What did you have to study in school for your job? And what school did you go to? And then I'll follow up with the one more question they have that's, yeah. Okay, so I had to study uh, a lot of different things. First, I went to I went to high school, and then I went to a junior college in Napa, Napa JC. I did some general education courses there, like English, um, you know, language, whatever. And then I transferred to UC Davis, um, so one of the University of California schools. Now, geology is kind of interesting because. It actually pairs a lot of different sciencey fields together. So I had to take the same calculus classes that the engineers had to take or the mathematicians, but then I also had to take physics and I had to take chemistry uh, because you need all those related disciplines and you need to understand them at least to a you know pretty to a pretty pretty thought out degree uh, to understand these geologic principles. So I had to do all that coursework and then after that it was all geology specific so things like understanding uh sediments and structural geology like mountains and geomorphology and you know fossils and paleobiology there's this, an endless amount of disciplines that you can go into as a geologist and um they're all super fascinating that's it I'm going back. I'm going to be a <laughs> geologist now. <laughs> you convinced me. Um, also, um, Mrs. Uh, Martira's fifth grade wants to know, what's the most exciting place you've traveled to? Most exciting place? Uh, if I choose, there's a single place. I've been to quite a few countries through the show. But for a place, I would say probably Timna Valley in Israel. Um, part of the kind of Mesopotamia area and Timna Valley has been settled for thousands of years. Um, so from the human perspective, it's fascinating. There's tons of archeological dig sites there and there's bones and they were smelting copper and all these other iron uh, like metals and such. But then also the geology of Timna Valley was fascinating. You get these huge rock structures. I think you can see it on the screen there. And then this, you know, it's an intense desert environment. So we were there, it was like 130 degrees or like something like 120 degrees, like mind blowing. I think it's about 120. Um, and it's a, such a extreme environment. It leaves a strong impression on you. So if I had to choose, I would say Timna Valley. If you're ever in Israel, take the trek down there. It's really fascinating. Oof, I loved, I loved watching all of those beautiful images and yeah. oh, it's just amazing that you found bones when you were there. Anyway, great. Um, we have two questions, one from Paula and one from Addison, wondering who inspired you and did any of your teachers help you, uh, help you out on, on your way to being a geophysicist? Um, I think I wouldn't be in the position I am today without the help from dozens or if not hundreds of people. Uh, all my teachers who inspired a passion for science and cultivated that in me, uh, obviously my parents and uh, my mom for really going out of her way to enroll me in these extracurricular activities. Um, so all of them I have to thank. And then in regards to role models, I mean, you have the Carl Sagan's, you have the, the Bill Nye's, the, the Neil deGrasse Tyson's, uh, those, more so when I was older, um, though I watched a lot of Bill Nye when I was in middle school because his shows came out in the early 90s, I believe. Um, but then just all the scientists that you hear about in the news, you know, you might be watching the news or reading an article and 
freezing a little bit. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we kind of lost in and out a little bit, but I think we're good now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so many scientists out there which are inspiring, and they're doing amazing work. So I think it's, um, it's really cool to follow um, these websites which post up-to-date scientific uh, discoveries because those are the, uh, the role models are really, they're out there doing the work, and they might not communicate the best in regards to uh, the science communication to others, but what they're doing is amazing. So I look up to them. Well, Abby and Nola and Hannah would like to know, before doing your current job, um, did you want to be an anthropologist? Uh, I don't know. You just like read my mind, basically, because <laughs> when I was at the uh, junior college after high school, I spent two years there, I did like five anthropology classes. And I joked around about how anthropology, I was actually leaning that direction for a while, but I once I went to geology, I joked around about how anthropology was my like kind of like my fake major or my pseudo major. So um, I love my anthro classes all the way from cultural anthropology to archaeology. Uh, they were all fascinating and uh, I really enjoy them. And that's why I think Tim Navalli had such an impact on me because it was the marriage between the geology and also the anthropology of the region. The region, the reason why so many people were settled in that valley was because of all the the copper deposits in the rocks. So you have this rich cultural history that developed there because of the geology. Man, that is absolutely you're right. It's the perfect marriage between the two. What Chase wants to know: Has coding or robotics ever been a part of your your sciences or STEM career? And uh, Adish wants to know what uh, other parts of STEM do you use in your job? Good questions. Um, I wish robotics. I mean, well, there are a lot of robotics I use for geophysics. Specifically for me, I've never had to code or use robotics. Though I wish that was the case when I was. When I was growing up in middle school and high school, uh, robotics is not was not nearly as popular as it is now. Now you go to classrooms all across the country and they have dedicated robotics classes and uh, people have made it much more uh, kind of easy to get into that field. Back in the day, it was really difficult. I was part of the engineering club and we built some cool stuff, but we didn't have access to robotics. Uh, coding. You can, coding can be really big with geophysics. I specifically, with the direction I've gone, don't need to code, though I understand a little bit of coding, HTML, JavaScript, et cetera, more just like front-end web development. But uh, some of the like most lucrative geophysics positions are the guys that understand the geophysics, and they also understand how to translate those theories into computer code. Um, so yeah, there's definitely tons of potential if you know how to code, and if you know how to use like make robotics in the geophysics field. That's super niche, and that'd be super valuable. And what was the second part again? I think I uh, mostly so we had. Uh, what other parts of STEM do you use in your job, and which one do you use the most? Oh yeah, uh, a lot of math, and uh, you know there's some chemistry and everything. Really, like I explained earlier, geology is a pretty encompassing field. You don't need to, for the most part, get very, very in-depth with the math. Um, but you need to understand all those concepts. Uh, I'd say probably like engineering and physics are the, the biggest ones that are used the most. If you don't understand those two, then you'll probably have the toughest time. But it's, it's all kind of learned through osmosis as you're going through the education. So if you if you do all the coursework or you learn online, you'll all kind of just absorb it over time. Curtis in he's a middle schooler in Maine wants to know where did you grow up and where do you live now? And Mason wants to know where you live as well. Oh well, um, I have family in Maine. I bet it's really really snowy there right now. But I grew up in Napa, California. Um, many people know it as wine country. Uh, it's where a lot of the wine is produced uh, for, you know, the states and also the world. That's actually another thing I wanted to get into as a kid was be a winemaker. So I think that would have been fascinating. But I grew up in Napa and I went to school in Davis, which is just an hour away. And uh, that all takes place in California. So I live in California. 
Uh, I'm still living in the same SF Bay area as I was when I grew up. So I haven't really moved and uh, I don't really want to because I love it here. Rohan and Addison want to know what are your hobbies and what's your favorite sport? Ah, uh, I have too many hobbies and I don't like I don't devote enough time to all of them. But uh, I'm really into uh, like health and fitness and nutrition. So that's a big one. Uh, but I've also been really into archery. Uh, I've really been into having a fish tank. Like I just devour everything there is to know and just go all out. So I have like, uh, I have like a really nice bow and arrow set. Uh, I've had like completely planted tanks with their own ecosystem that I've designed and modeled and developed and everything. Um, I mean, I, there, there's, there's a lot more, but those are the two, the two that pop into my head the, uh, the most easily. And then in school, I played water polo and I also did swimming. So I think water polo is a really fun sport. It's really fast paced. It's really energetic. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to watch water polo on TV. They don't really show that much. But if you watch the 2020 Olympics, you'll see it there. Uh, and then probably my favorite sport, though, is probably Olympic weightlifting. Um, the, the skill and athletic ability of Olympic weightlifters is unimaginable. So. I really, I really, it's kind of a smaller sport, but I'm really big into that. And also I'm really, uh, really big fan of strongman, just, just these huge, massive women and men just picking up boulders and stuff. I find that really fascinating. Very cool. I know that one of our producers here, Jason, is going to be very excited that you like Olympic lifting. Ah. Um, uh, Elliot wonders, what is your favorite geologic time period? Oh man, there's so many. Um, I think every geologic time period has something unique about it, but I think really what we what we know the least amount about is the formation of the Earth when the solar system was first forming. And it sounds like such a chaotic and kind of dynamic uh, period of Earth's history. I wish we knew more about it, and it kind of has the biggest, you know, I'm the most curious about that about that uh, part of Earth's history. So. You know, they theorized that the Earth was almost completely molten at that point. There was just so much extra energy and heat, and all the elements in the Earth were still separating out based off of their density. So I think that is really, really interesting. And I'm really excited to see how much more we learn about that within our lifetime because that takes some really intense science, and you have to be really, really smart to figure that out. All right, here comes a, a loaded question from, from your room here. Colin and Paola, they want to know, what are the tools behind you? And have any of your tools stopped working in the middle of your job? Uh, I'll, ask, I'll answer the second part first. Yes, it happens all the time. The tools stop working. It's extremely frustrating because uh, sometimes you're on a time crunch or you're in the middle of a critical part of the data acquisition process. But I have a seismograph right here. This is the uh, the geode, and it has a geophone. So this little geophone right here measures basically any force that's traveling through the Earth. And then this big guy here, it looks like a almost like a missile or a torpedo. That's the uh, that's a marine magnetometer. So it measures the magnetic field of basically of the ocean. So when you're, when you throw it in the water, it'll measure the magnetic field of basically surroundings and since it's in the ocean, it'll be of the ocean. We also have a, a backpack magnetometer here that you can wear to measure the magnetic field. And uh, then we have a base station magnetometer here. So this is just a small selection of the equipment we have. We have some pretty big pieces of equipment and tools, but I can't fit them on my office desk. So. These are the ones I elected to bring out to show uh, the Jason, you know, live event. And we put out on social media, we put out one of the videos, and you're taking some kind of seismic data, and you're, uh, you have a, a, big, a big hammer, and you're smashing something on the ground. That's part of your job? Yeah. So, so that is using the geode here. And basically, this is a computer. And uh, it has a whole bunch of internal uh, hardware units and stuff. But what I was doing 
what I was doing with that sledgehammer is we would put these geophones all across the ground, or as you might be able to see in my little demonstration up there, but you put a whole bunch of geophones down and you take this hammer and you hit the ground with it to import a, input a lot of energy into the ground. Um, and then those geophones you put in, they measure the amount of energy that comes back. So you'll have different layers of the earth and the energy will go down like this and then it'll bounce off of different rock layers. So it goes down, bounces, and then it hits the geophone up there. So you can measure a lot of different physical properties uh, using simply a sledgehammer and some uh, pieces of electronics. Well, very cool. I hope, I hope that answer came through. It was a little bit muffled for me for a second there. I oh, think it's. Sorry. I think my my computer is the problem here. Um, but we have a comment from Oh Sabrina wants to know why do you enjoy this STEM field so much? I just really like how geophysics takes so many different STEM kind of fields and puts them together. So you have you have physics, you have engineering, you have geology, you have mathematics. Sometimes you might have chemistry, hydrogeology. Uh, and you need to have an understanding of all of them to be a proficient geophysicist. And it forces you to understand all these fields. So you really have to go out of your way to learn all these different, you know, things about the earth and how it works and all these other, you know, chemical properties and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm really a big fan of geophysics. It is really once I took the coursework and I took the classes, it just kind of hit me, okay, I need to do this. And that's the story of a lot of geologists. A lot of geologists, most people don't go to college and they're like, oh, I'm going to be a geologist. Most people go to college for a different career. They take a geology class because they need some credits and then they fall in love with it and they do it. So if more people, if geology was more well known or geophysics in general was more well known, I think you would have a huge influx of people wanting to get into this profession. It's just this kind of underground, no pun intended right now. So if the best thing you do is when you go to college, take a geology class and see how you like it. Okay, well that this is a perfect lead in to our final question here. Yes. Um, from Lily wanting to know, um, what advice would you give to young adults pursuing a career in science? A um, couple things. So you don't, you don't need to have what you want to do completely thought out, contrary to what a lot of people tell you. A lot of people say, oh, you need to know what your major is going into college. It's fine going into Claire. Don't be apprehensive about that. Um, if you're just into science in general like I am, take as many different courses as you can. Get a feel of all the different things. One course will tell you pretty well whether you're interested in it in it or not. So take a food science course, take a, uh, take a biochemistry course, take a geology course, really just kind of become uh, accustomed and learn all these different fields. And I think you'll be able to say, okay, I enjoyed that one the most. Uh, and then the other thing that no one talks about, um, everyone is always like, okay, do your homework, get good grades, and then, you know, you'll get a job or something. No one ever talks about the social aspect where you need to be good at networking or you need to just, you need to cultivate relationships. And it's the same with any field. If you don't cultivate strong relationships with your professors or with the, the actual, you know, work industry, um, then you're going to have a tough time finding a job after college. I can pretty definitively say that the reason Secrets Underground approached me for season two to be a co-host is because I did a really, really good job communicating with them and networking with them. And I had a skill set that they didn't have, AKA I had a skill set of knowing geophysics and they found that valuable. And therefore we entered into a you know beneficial relationship where I was the co-host, but then I helped them with all the geophysics on this, you know, for the show. So really, I think that's the one thing that people don't talk about especially at my college, no one said, oh yeah, you know, network and talk to people and just cultivate these relationships. Everyone's just saying, do your, do your coursework and you'll be fine. And that's not the case. And you're really good at it. 
thank you so much for for coming and doing this with us. And unfortunately, that that's all the time we have. What? But there is a I know it went by like that. But we have a whole slew <laughs> of people, Joey and Adish and Colin, saying thank you, thank you so much, thank you for coming, you know, thank you for uh, answering our questions. And um, so thank you for oh. for coming and doing this. We're excited, JCV Stem and Abby. You really taught us a lot. Thanks for talking with us from Sarah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, think this is, uh, I think this is a really fun experience. And uh, that one hour went by very quick. But I really need to be thanking you guys for tuning in and, you know, giving me and Haley the platform to talk about science. Because without, without everyone supporting Jason.org, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And I think it's a good conversation to have because the regular school system just doesn't talk about these subjects and doesn't do the best job at uh, educating specifically on science, in my opinion. So, you know, other organizations like Jason have pick it, picked up the slack. I think they're doing a great job and uh, it's all because of you guys. So yeah, thank you thank so much. Thank you for watching. Thank you guys. Um, we have our next event is coming up on February 22nd, featuring STEM role model Allison Johnson, who is a manager of a technical marketing at TransOcean. And we can all ask, we can ask her all sorts of questions about drilling in deep ocean and other really crazy, technically challenging environments. And remember, we are on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So if you want to connect with us before our next live event, you can feel, feel free to do that and, and you'll find us there. Until then, from Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson, and we'll see you next time on Jason Live. Terminated.